Uh, for those who do not know me, my name is Buster Swoops. I used to be the pastor here at Crowley, I think from 2015 to 2018, and now I serve at Southwestern Adventist University in the theology program. And Pastor Adam Keating has been so kind and nice to allow me to begin my doctoral process, uh, my project here. So for the four, next four weeks, I'll be actually talking about holistic biblical revival. Uh, but before I begin that, listen here, I, 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 I'm so excited to, to be here, so excited to do that, so excited to see what Jesus Christ is about to do, not only in your hearts, but most importantly in mine. Uh, I had to look in the mirror today and say, Lord, am I living out what am I about to preach? And he just reminded me, it's not you who's doing it, it's, a, it's you who is allowing me into your life to live it out. Amen? So I'm praying that, that you don't put the pressure on yourself to say, oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to make this happen. No, allow Jesus Christ to come into your life to transform your life. So before we do that, I, I was in prayer about how to begin this, this sermon today, and I want to start it off. Uh, for those of you who don't know this, back in Jesus' day, and I, I think we miss out on this aspect in the, the church today, when they were in the synagogue, and you see this a little bit in, in Luke, where Jesus stands up and he reads, and it says that they start discussing amongst themselves that there wasn't just singing, and then all of a sudden someone comes up and preaches, and everyone goes home. No, there's discussion of Scripture. There is discussion of what happened. So I want to start off this morning with a question to you. And in your family groups, if you're not with the family, if you're single, if you're, if you're amongst three or four people, so if you think it's a little bit chaotic, it's okay, because this is Holy Spirit-driven, I want you to discuss with each other, what is the purpose of a sermon? What is the purpose of the sermon, of a sermon? Uh, so go ahead, turn to each other. I'm going to give you about three to five minutes just to discuss that. Kids, I want you involved in that. I want you to tell your parents, what do you think the purpose of a sermon is? And it's not to put you to sleep. I promise you that, all right? Uh, so discuss that amongst yourselves and, and just talk about what is the purpose of a sermon, all right? Starting now. I see some people discussing. I see some people still looking at me. Some people having a conversation with themselves. That's okay as well. Okay, you have about one minute left, so make your, make your point succinct. Okay, let's all come back together now. And I want you to do me a favor and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses, starting at verse 18. And as you're turning there, uh, this is uh, the New King James Version. This reminds me every time why I stand before you, anytime I get a chance to go around and preach the gospel, so that I never get bloviated with myself, but I can be filled more with Christ. Uh, the Apostle Paul starts off with this to the letter to the Corinthian church. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Amen? 
We can explain that a little bit more here in just a second, but look at verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now, pay, uh, uh, pay special attention to verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. I'm going to read that again. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Verse 22, for the Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. My friends, I'm not here to entertain you. I'm not here so you can walk away with warm fuzzies and saying, oh, that was a great sermon. I'm not here for goosebumps. I'm not here for that touching moment. I'm here to introduce and reintroduce you to Christ and Him crucified. I'm here to proclaim a message of salvation, but it's up to you to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You know, I, I think that we've turned church into an event. We've turned church into an exciting arena, but it's not supposed to be about that. It's supposed to be about Jesus. It's supposed to be about the wisdom of God being portrayed unto man so that they can see their great need of the gospel story in their own lives. And I'm praying, I'm praying that for the next four weeks, you are not entertained. I'm praying for the next four weeks, you're not on the edge of your seats because of anything I have to say, but you're on the edge of your seats because you see Christ more clearly. And as my custom is, the true test of a good sermon does not happen on Sabbath morning, but it happens on Sunday morning when you actually get up and you open up the word for yourself and spend time with the Savior. It happens on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday night that before you lay your head down, you actually spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplating about the Savior and his life and his closing, especially his closing scenes. My friends, the, the purpose of preaching is for us to see Christ and him cru crucified so that all may be transformed so the world will once again realize their great need of salvation. Let's bow our heads. Lord God, now this next few moments that we have, I, I know that we spent some time speaking to each other, conversing, but God, I praise you that in the midst of our conversations, your Holy Spirit is being poured out upon us, convicting, of, convicting us of ways that you're calling us to live our lives, different than, Lord, maybe any way that we've ever lived. I'm asking that, Lord, we start living our lives in a way that the world starts thinking that we're crazy, because, God, we are so in love with you. That, God, we are willing to do anything it takes to make sure that we follow you with all of our hearts, souls, minds, and strength. That, God, we're willing to do anything it takes to, Lord, see your face each and every day. As, Lord, we're seeking to spark revival here at the Crowley Seventh-day Adventist Church, God, may it begin in my house, may it begin in my life, not because of anything that I've done, but simply because I've turned and said, I want to see Jesus. I need to see Jesus. And I can see you in prayer and in seeking your word. Lord, may we all see you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're in the thick of it, aren't we? I don't know about you, but for the last probably like six or seven months, I can barely stand to turn on the news. I can barely stand to read the news. I can barely stand to talk to people about political objects of whatever side you're on and everything else. And I start looking back strategically, recognizing the enemy truly is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I start looking at what the world is doing and what the church is doing, and I'm deeply saddened because oftentimes I don't see much of a differentiation anymore. And I say this because there has to be hope. There has to be something more. And I, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm excited because 
there is hope found in what God is doing. God is still in control, amen? amen. And, and, and as I say that, and as I think that, and as I believe that, I start asking myself, God, how are you in control? And I realize we have never been in control of anything. <laughs> Listen here, I, I am glad to say I vote, but uh, at the end of the day, we, we vote and we take down everything else, but there's things happening behind the scenes that we have no idea of. But why is it that we get so bent out of shape for things that we can't control, and things that we can't control, we oftentimes find ourselves doing nothing? What do I mean by that? I want to ask you this question. Do you really want God, or do you want the idea of God? Do you really want God, or do you want the idea of God? If you don't understand what I'm saying, uh, when you have a chance to, uh, I think it's Matthew 19, look at the rich young ruler who is saying, I want God, but he didn't really want God. He wanted the idea of God, because what he actually wanted is he wanted his stuff, and he wanted to take it to heaven with him. He wanted to have increase, and he wanted it for eternity. I think we love the concept and the idea of eternity, but do we actually love God? Do we actually want God? So this brings me to the why are we talking about holistic biblical revival for the next four weeks? Uh, as I'm going through my doctoral classes and our research, we have to write a doctoral project. And, and they're telling us, they want us to, to look to biblically solve an issue that's happening. And I realize that as the world is going crazy, as we have mass shootings all over the place, as we have political divides, as we have biblical divides all over, that one of the things that's missing is God's people who are actually falling into revival. Uh, uh, we're going to bring up some historical accounts as early as, as next week. As, as early as next week. But what is revival? Uh, Henry Blackaby, an author, puts it this way. Revival is a divinely initiated work in which God's people pray, repent of their sin, and return to a Holy Spirit-filled, obedient love relationship with God. I want to say that again. Revival is a divinely initiated work in which God's people pray, repent of their sin, return to a Holy Spirit-filled, obedient love relationship with God. Uh, Dawn, she said, Buster, we're back there in the back. She says, we're singing about walking with God. Does that have anything to do with your sermon? I, I looked at the, the title of your sermon. I said, absolutely it does. What greater privilege do we have in this life than to walk with Jesus Christ? Amen? And yet, it's one of the, times, one of the things that we oftentimes neglect. Uh, one of my favorite script, uh, scriptures is Micah 6, 8. He has shown you a man. And what does the Lord require of you but to act justly, love mercy, and to do what? To walk humbly with your God, that word walk, to halak, that means to actually, literally, figuratively walk with Jesus Christ. Uh, him being at the forefront of your tongue, at the forefront of your mind, whenever you go, wherever you go, you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I go back to that question, do you really want God or do you want the idea of God? Any time that I've studied and I looked at biblical revival, I found that there's two things that happen. God's people are in his word, and they are actually seeking his presence, and they're doing it together. If you start turning with me in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 7.14, 2 Chronicles 7.14, as we're turning there, I, I want to give a little bit of context and let you know that, that for the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at different texts uh, matter of fact, I'll give you a, a heads up. Next week, we're going to be looking at Psalm 85. Psalm 85. So if you want to get a head start, start looking at Psalm 85. This week, we're looking at 2 Chronicles 7.14. And as you're turning there, I, I want you to, to recognize something. Solomon is dedicating the temple to the Lord. Uh, David actually collected all the materials. He thought he was going to get a chance to build the, the temple, but the Lord told him, because of all the blood that's on your hands, you're not allowed to build the temple. So Solomon actually gets a chance to carry out his father's dream, but also his dream. And when he builds it, it's, it's not enough to just build it. He says, God, we're dedicating this to you because we need you to dwell in this place. Reminds me of Leviticus 25. Let them build me a temple so that I may dwell with them. And so here the temple is built, and they're asking God's presence to fill the place and miraculously, not, I was going to say miraculously, 
with expectation, God's presence actually fills the place. How do we know this? Well, if you turn to me, uh, as you're there already in 2 Chronicles chapter, chapter 7, it says, uh, uh, verse, verse 9, it says, And on the eighth day they held a sacred assembly, for they observed the dedication of the altar seven days and the feast seven days. And on the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people away to the tents of joy, and the Lord had done... Uh, uh, Good for the good that the Lord had done for David, Solomon, and his people of Israel. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and Solomon successfully accomplished all that, uh, that came into his heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house. Now listen to this. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a, as a house of sacrifice. But it goes on, it says... When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. I'm going to stop there. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that the ultimate goal is what? Salvation of God's people. In order to bring up about that salvation, I think sometimes we have a misnomer. We believe that it means that life for those of us who are with God means that our lives will be seamless, it will be great, that there are never any bumps, there is never any issues, there, there's, there's, there's never any troubles. Amen to that? Anybody with me? We we'll love that, right? And God is saying, no, that's, that's not what you need. As a matter of fact, if I gave you all of those things, you would start looking at worshiping yourself and worshiping your stuff rather than worshiping me right? Uh, okay, so, so some of you are with me. But I, I, I say this because he is saying, when I shut up heaven, who shut up heaven? God is saying, when I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. By the way, those of you who know history, there's a reason for this. Oftentimes, instead of worshiping God, what were they doing? They were worshiping the gods that were around them. And as a result of that, God is saying, my blessing is withdrawn from you. Now, sometimes we'll say, well, that means that if we ever suffer anything bad, it must mean that I did something wrong. No. <laughs> Suffering comes about uh, just as it rains on the just and the unjust. Uh, blessings are oftentimes from God and that fall upon the just and the unjust, but also suffering comes upon the just and the unjust. Uh, I love Pastor Michael Gibson who, who put it this way. God oftentimes isn't the one who causes our suffering. Sometimes he does. Sometimes he brings that about, but he never wastes our suffering. Do you understand what I'm saying? Whatever you're going through right now, whatever you're dealing with, God will use that to bring you closer to him and to help someone else who is going through their suffering to bring them closer to him as well. So this is when, when God speaks in verse 14, it says this. And we're going to break this down verse by verse, or, or, or precept on precept. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, right away here, listen to this. If my people, if my people, what is if? Start of a conditional clause. What is a conditional clause? Well, it's not rocket science. It is literally a clause with condition on it. This is a clause of, hey, uh, let, me, let me pick out one of the kids in church. Uh, Vincent, uh, uh, if you come to my house, I will give you $5. What does Vincent have to do? He has to come to my house, right? All right, and so, so this is what happens. Oftentimes we hear the conditions like, all right, God, we start negotiating. Have you, have you ever started negotiating with God? All right, God, I really want that $5 but my gas is high, right? So I'm going to spend as much gas in order to get there. Or God, uh, I can't make it right now. Can I make it tomorrow? You know what's so amazing about God? Is that his mercy is vast, and he puts these conditions on, but he says, I will give you all of your life to fulfill the end of your condition. And when you mess up, I will forgive you for messing up. I am here, but you are still called to fulfill this condition. If my people... Uh, in other words, Vincent, you can come tomorrow to pick up the $5, or 20 years from now, if you show up to my house, you're still getting $5. You know what this means for us? 
A lot of us say, God, I want you. I want to follow you. And God is saying, the door is open. And some people will get up right now in this very moment as you feel the Holy Spirit calling you, connecting you to him, and you say, Jesus Christ, right now in my heart, I choose you. But there's some of us with doubts that are sitting here that are saying, uh, maybe tomorrow. And tomorrow turns into 10 years, and 10 years turns into 20. But 20 years from now, you say, finally say, Jesus Christ, right now I choose you, and the door is still open. But the problem is, tomorrow is not promised for any of us. Our volition, our, our choices, why not capitalize on them today? Seek the Lord while he may still be found. Don't wait till tomorrow. Start today. So it starts there with this condition. If my people who are what? Called by my name. By the way, my people, who are his people? Who, who are his children? I, I heard someone say out there, someone said everybody. everybody. Everyone who chooses to be. I know we sit here, listen here, your denomination affiliation does not make you his people. There are sheep who are not yet of this fold. There are people out there who are secular and worldly as all get out that I believe in the end will be his people because they choose to be his people. Uh, it's like I put this all the time. The adoption papers have been sent out. They have been signed. And he is waiting for us to say, all right, I accept this. I, I think I told the story a, a couple of years ago and there's an update to it. Uh, Tom Evans, uh, he actually went to uh, uh, another country. I'm going to mess up the name. I think it's Lithuania. It uh, might be another country. But he adopted, tried to adopt two boys. And in the end, those two boys said, you know what? We have a pretty good life here. We're allowed to do whatever we want to do. We don't want to come live with you. Uh, but uh, about as early as two years ago, they called back and said, we're ready for you to become our family, Right? So even though they didn't accept it originally, two years went by and they finally called back and they said, no, we want to come live with you. We will live under what you have in store for us. And that's the same for us today, that God wants us to be with them, but it's not under your conditions, it's under his conditions. In other words, once we come to God, our negotiation is gone and it's now us seeking not our way, but it's seeking his way. And this is what's so hard about Christianity today because we all love to make it the flair of it of our own and say, well, I follow God, but I do it this way because this is how I feel comfortable. When is the gospel ever called, go ye therefore and make your life more comfortable? <laughs> go ye therefore and, and, and make more disciples, baptizing and teaching. Those are not comfortable situations. Uh, following the rest of Second Chronicles 7.14, it's not always so comfortable. How do we know this? If my people who are called by my name, recognizing this, he is the one that is calling, and he is calling everyone, but few are picking up the phone to say, Lord, here I am. When you pick up the phone and say, Lord, here I am, you are his people. You are his people, amen? So we should take joy and relish in that fact. But if my people are called by my name and will humble themselves. This word, uh, originally called kana. To admit that I don't have it correct, but God, that you do. To admit that you are God and I am not. To admit that your way is the best way and I have no idea what I'm doing. That is humbling yourself before the mighty, almighty God. The problem is we love control. I love control. I, I love being uh, in a, an environment where I know what's going to happen next and how it's going to happen. But that's not how life always is. And the greatness of this journey, of this walk that we have with God, is admitting to God, I need more of you and less of me. Humbling ourselves that you are God and that I am not. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and then do what? Pray. But before we get there, before we get to pray, humble themselves. You know, sometimes we, we, we read and says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will what? He will lift you up, right? But sometimes we wait till the Lord humbles us. Listen here, you don't want to wait till the Lord humbles you. <laughs> it happens and he will do it, but it's much greater to actually read the word and to submit to him before he causes things or things 
things in life itself causes us to humble ourselves. Humble yourself because you love God. That's why we humble ourselves. And humble yourself not once a week, but humble yourself every day before the Lord. So humble themselves. Don't wait, do it now. The Holy Spirit prompts and we answer. But then it comes across this word and pray. Pray. Humble themselves and pray. And I think that sometimes, I know for my, myself, sometimes my prayers are not answered the way that I want them to be. It's because I seek the Lord while I'm puffed up with pride. And I'm praying for this, and I'm praying for that, but I didn't take out the time to humble myself before the Lord before I start praying. You want to know the easiest way to humble yourself before you start praying? Is to read the Word. Read the Word. Allow the words to not... Listen here, there's times where I'm puffed up for myself, and I'm like, yep, if my people were called by my name, those people, they're not called, and they'll humble themselves. Lord, I'm thankful I'm one of the most humble people I know, right? <laughs> and pray and seek my faith. Lord, you know how many, oh man, I pray all the time, and I'm just like, oh, I'm bloviating, and I'm, I'm like, oh man, this is good. But if I really take out the time to stop thinking about you while I'm reading, and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to me while I'm reading, if Buster Swoops, who was called by my name, will humble, himself and, will humble himself and pray and seek my face and turn from his wicked ways. And I start thinking, Lord, just yesterday, just today, right now, in what ways are my ways wicked? Do I need to turn over to you? And he flashes a thousand things of ways that I'm not, I'm not walking in his way. And it gives me not a, a, a sense of guilt, but it gives me a sense of conviction of recognizing my great need for the Savior. So check this out. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves. So humbling yourself, having a spirit of humility before you see God, and then praying. And this is, this is how I know that I am actually humble in that moment or not is am I spending my time selfishly praying for myself, or am I spending my time praying, interceding on the behalf of others? As you look at, at men who were spiritual and women who were spiritual in the Word, when they prayed, they weren't praying for themselves. They were praying for what? Others. Now, is there anything wrong about praying for yourself? Absolutely not. But how often times did, did Jesus pray and it was just for himself? Now listen here, he prayed, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But what else did he say? Not my will, but what be will be done? Thy will be done. In John chapter 17, he is praying, Lord, may they be one as you and I are one. He is interceding. He is praying on behalf of not only the disciples, he is praying on our behalf. And now I, I ask you about your own life. How much of your life is spent on prayer about yourself or how much of it is spent on actually interceding on the behalf of others? My people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and then do what? I love this phrase, seek my face. Seek my face, earnestly and eagerly looking for God, reading our word, getting off our phones, stopping looking at everything else, the political divides like I mentioned earlier, and taking out time to truly seek the presence of God. Imagine this, just for a second. If we spent as much time, if, 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 I, I thought of this the, the other day. If I never watched a movie or a television show in my life and I spent that time reading the Word of God. Listen here, I know that's not realistic, right? I'm not telling you to go home and destroy your televisions and everything else. I'm just saying, how, how many times have you said in your life, I just don't have time? and your work calls, and you put in another two hours, or whatever calls, and you put in another hour doing whatever it might be, because we have our lives figured out, and we do this at four o'clock, and three o'clock we do this, and we're there, when, and our lives are so full of chaos, and so full of so much stuff, that we forget what is the most important thing, and that is us seeking the face of God, that is us spending time in His Word, that is us seeking God in prayer, that is us reading the Word. Why? Because in eternity, in heaven, what do you think we're going to be doing? Absolutely, we'll be spending time with God, and you know what else we'll be spending time with? Each other. One of the two greatest things that we have, the greatest resources that we have, and oftentimes they're neglected. 
How many families are splint and torn apart because of busyness? And it's busyness not for goodness sake, it's busyness for busyness sake. Well, because this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be busy, and you need to do these things, and you need to go here or go there. No, you don't have to. You can choose God, and you can choose people. You can choose service over the selfish things that we oftentimes choose. But we have to want volition. It has to come to the point of we're saying, God, I want to humble myself. I want to pray. I want to seek your face. And then, this is the key, after we seek his face, and we find his face, by the way, in his word once again, we have to then turn ourselves, or actually not turn ourselves, turn from their wicked ways. There's a reason why it is successively like this. Before you seek his face, we have to pray. Before we even pray, we humble ourselves because his presence is asking us to do that. And then his word shows us how to turn and what to turn from. And this becomes the guiding principle by which I live my life of saying, Lord, help me to do, and this word means to do a, a 180 and turn away from the things that I'm turning away from. By the way, I say 180, I used to say 360, right? But what does 360 do? Well, if I'm walking this way and I do a 360, I can, oh, I'm still walking this way, right? But if I'm doing a 180, if I'm walking towards the ways of the world, when I turn this way, now I'm walking towards God. God is saying, I want you to not only mentally turn, I want you to physically turn. I want your obedience, but I don't want your obedience so you can save yourself. I want your obedience because you love me, because you are in love with me, because you want that relationship that I'm calling you to. Then it says, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. I love this this phrase then, because it sets up the conditional clause. These are the conditions. What are the conditions? Well, you're called to be my people, to humble yourself, to pray, seek my face, and turn. Then will I hear from heaven. And not only that, uh, this word here means will I comprehend. God is always listening, but he is not always hearing us. Do you understand that? That if we're not in alignment with God, he, is, he will not in a way, uh, there's, there's this thing that we do when we talk with God, and maybe you've felt it before, maybe you've known it, where we're talking to God, then where we're talking with God. The conversations that we have with God, prayer is not a one-way thing. It is actually a two-way thing. And when we talk to God, he speaks back to us, but we have to have our ears attentive and listening just as he is attentive to us. And so as we are turning, then he hears from heaven, and he comprehends with us, and he will forgive our sins. He will pardon us every single time, heal our land. He will cure our issues. He will fix whatever is going on in our lives. He will be with us. He will strengthen us. God is with us. He will be here. Well, how does this happen? Verse 15. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer made in this place. Verse 16, now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be, may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. I don't know about you, but I, I long for that prayer. <laughs> I long for that day when God can say that I'm not only dwelling in the temple that was then, by the way, that temple is no longer standing, but there's a different temple that God wants to dwell in. And you've probably guessed it already, and that's the temple of our hearts, but it's even more than that. It's the temple of our homes. It's the temple of our family units. It's the temple of our marriages. It's the t Do you understand what I'm talking about? And all these different things, the temples of our workplaces, the temples of our cars. God wants to dwell in all aspects of our lives, but are we opening those crevices that we've closed off for him to actually enter in? So we're talking about revival. I came across this in True Revival, page 9. Sister White says this, A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because God is not willing to bestow his blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. 
Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give us his Holy Spirit to, to them that ask him than our earthly parents to give good gifts to their children. But it is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us his blessing. And I ask you that question I asked at the beginning. Do you really want God or do you want the idea of God? I'll, I'll phrase it a different way. Do you want the God who is here to transform your life or do you want the God that other movies portray, portray as a genie? God, I need this, poof, what do you need? God, I need this, poof, what do you need? God, I need this, oh, I got you. Or do, are we willing to say, God, you are God, I am not. Come into my life as I pray, seek your face, turn from my wicked ways. God, transform me from the inside out because this is, the, this is the key. And this is how we're ending today. We're not the only ones seeking revival. There are sheep who are literally not of this fold, who are looking for more, who recognize the decomposing of this world, and they're wondering, where is Jesus? And they need you to be a beacon and a light to speak up and to speak out. And I'm not just talking... Uh, in terms where no one's hearing me, there are people and testimonies I hear of right now, and I bet you there's a thousand more that are in this place, uh, several of you that are witnessing to some of your neighbors and the people that are receptive. Now, just last month, uh, actually, no, it was this month, a couple of weeks ago, Lauren and I, we, for the first time in our, in our marriage, actually took four days, or yeah, it was a four-day uh, cruise together to celebrate our 15th year of marriage, Amen. <laughs> Uh, my in-laws watched the kids, so it was just us. It was, uh, I missed you guys, but it was great. All right, uh, my son's looking at me like, huh? Like, all right, we, they were at a beach house in Galveston. My, my in-laws had them having fun at the beach every day. But every night, uh, they set us at a table, and uh, it's kind of a little bit awkward because we sat next to these people, and we had no idea who they were. Uh, Jack and Leslie were their names that we found out later. And as we're sitting there, I'm like, oh, this is so awkward. Uh, we're looking at each other. What are you ordering? What are you ordering, right? And you're trying to act like they're not there, but they're there. And then something just prompted me, like we always do. I said, Lauren, let, I grabbed her hand and we prayed. And we opened up our eyes. I'm telling you, like, like nothing else, the gentleman, or, or the, the lady who was sitting across from us, she's like, we're basically, you guys prayed? That's so amazing. We're Christians as well, but we're looking for a Bible-believing church, and we haven't been able to find one. And it was funny about this, even more funny, is Lauren just wrote a paper for one of my classes, by the way. Yes, I'm uh, her professor, right? She's like, don't say it. There's a, okay, I won't tell you the other part of the joke. All right, so uh, <laughs> she just looked at me and said, no, sweetie, don't say it. All right, but she just finished writing a paper. She said, how to witness as an introverted person. And you know, it's funny, when you ask God for opportunities, what does he do? He drops them in your lap, and so... We had this opportunity. I'm witnessing to him. She's witnessing to her. And we just had this wonderful bond. As a matter of fact, I just finished texting them uh, yesterday. He told me he Google stalked me and watched some of my sermons. I'm like, uh-oh. He's like, praise the Lord. They're good. He's that they're biblical. This is, yeah, it was great. And I told him God placed us in each other's lives to actually lead each other towards him. Amen? But listen, I, 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 this is not the only story this is happening to. Philip and Marilyn Gates, I know right now you guys are, are, are having some Bible studies with some of your neighbors. Uh, Brittany, there's an opportunity coming up for you as well. Uh, Heather Mascarenas. But I'm telling you right now, Tony Visnievich, you've been witnessing to some of your, your coworkers. These things are happening because God is not only pouring out his spirit upon us, he's pouring it out upon the world, seeking those who are seeking him. And I tell you right now, it is impossible to lead someone to a place where we are not. By the way, that doesn't mean that you've arrived. It means that you have a desire to get there. When you have a desire to be with Christ, people see it and they want it. And they say, how do you get there? And you say, listen, I'm trying to figure it out as well, but I know that where the answers are found, and they're found here in his word. 
They're found as we humble ourselves and as we pray and as we seek his face and as we turn from our wicked ways because we want to be obedient and love towards God. And as we do those things, God brings other people along with us. This is the purpose of the church is that when we start going wayward, we actually come alongside of each other and we encourage each other saying, no, let's find Jesus Christ together. Let's find God together. Uh, brother so-and-so, I'm not letting you slip away. Sister so-and-so, I'm not allowing you to slip away because we are called to seek him, not alone, but together. No notice this, and this is the, the very last point. If my people are called by my name, notice that that is written in the plural. I don't think it's by accident that that happens, but I believe that we're called to pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways and all those different things and humble ourselves, not just in the mirror, not just alone, but we have something that the world does not have, and that is the community of believers that stand upon the rights and the morals of the word of God, and we're called to do this together. Amen. Revival... Maybe it starts with someone that, that the Lord is prompting, but oftentimes it began with groups. It began with the early church. It began with a group of disciples and, and other believers in an upper room who are praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit fell upon them, it was poured out to all of them. In other words, I need you for revival. God needs us for revival. In other words, we have to open up. Now, if it's, to be, if it's to be, Lord, let it begin with me, but it will never end with you. It will always spread like wildfire to others. It's like that song, it only takes a spark and we need to pass it on. The problem is a lot of us have that spark and we've smothered it out until it's gone lower and lower and lower because we don't want to pass it on because what if I pass it on and it's rejected? Well, if it's rejected, who cares? <laughs> We're called to only do what God has called us to do, which is to allow it to shine and pass it on, to continue to spend time with him, to continue to allow his life to be lived out in each and every one of us. So I, 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 as always, I have a challenge for you. This week, start looking over uh, Psalm 85, but not only that, start looking at 2 Chronicles 7.14 and following, I won't, I, won't, I won't call those steps, Start following in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you have been, if you are in a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm asking you to increase your time, increase your intensity with that, because the world's salvation is dependent upon it. It is by the foolishness of the message preached that Jesus Christ has decided to save the world. But how is he going to save the world unless you and I are living out the sermons he is calling us to preach? Lord God, as we are about to transition to a different aspect of, of the service and about to sing trust and obey, help us, Lord, to actually trust and obey you. But, Lord, help us to actually live out this holistic biblical revival and, Lord, seeking your face and praying and humbling ourselves and, and, Lord, in all things, turning from our wicked ways to live after you. Lord, if it is to be, let it begin with every single one of us saying, Lord, here we are, Send us, use us as we turn our lives over to you. This we ask in the name and the power of Jesus Christ. Amen.